different mood, completely different than the normal mood of Radharani. He also has the aspect of the energy of Lalita Saki within his existence, so he's a combination of Lalita Saki. Therefore, he is known as Vrindavaneshwari. He is also known as that. You read the pastimes in the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, but especially in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, you can learn a lot about the Gadadhar Pandit, his intimate relationships with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And practically his separable relationship with Lord Chaitanya, he was practically never separated. In fact, they were only born two months apart. Gadadhar Pandit appeared two months after Lord Chaitanya. So they were like childhood friends, and they grew up together, and they associated with each other all the way to the end of the Leelas, which was no other person in Lord Chaitanya's Leela who had so much association. Of course, towards the end, it was Rupa Goswami and Ramananda Roy who were very close to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Gadadhar Pandit was not there at that time, although he was present so, uh, Gadadhar Pandit is uh, very special. Uh, you, he is uh, Radharani appearing once again. Uh, so, we'll read from Srimad Bhagavatam and then I'll speak maybe a few, one or two different pastimes of Gadadhar Pandit and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, as time allows. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Sabuya Pachajanyayam Ajana Parisan Vitaha Putram Agyanaya Daksha Sarvalasvam Harasrinyaha Sabuya Pachajanyayam Agena Parishan Pitaha Putran Agyanaya Daksha Savalashwam Sahasrinaha Swabuya Pachajanyayam Agena Parishan Vitaha Putram Agya Naya Daksha Savalashwan Sahasrinaha
ladies. Sa Prajapati Daksa Buya Again Pajajanyayam In the womb of his wife Aksigni Or Panchajani Agena By Lord Brahma Parishan Vitaha being pacified. Putran, sons. Agyanayat, begat. Daksha, Prajapati, Taka. Prabhupada would say Taka. Taka is how you say Daksha in Bengali. You don't say I say Taka. Savalashwan Name the Savalashwas Sahasrina Numbering 1000 Translation Purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada When Prajapati Dhaka was lamenting for the loss of his children Lord Brahma pacified him with instructions. And thereafter, Daka begat 1,000 more children in the wife of his wound, Panchajani. This time, his sons were known as the Savalasvas. Please repeat, when, da when Prajapati Daka was lamenting for the loss of his children, Lord Brahma pacified him with instructions. And thereafter, Dhaka beget 1,000 more children in the, wife of his, in the womb of his wife, Pachajani. This time, his sons were known as the Salvalasvas. Purport. Prajapati Daka was so named because he was very expert in begetting children. Some people would like that expertise. Right? The word Daka means expert. First he begat 10,000 children in the womb of his wife. And when the children were lost, when they returned home back to Godhead, he begat another set of children known as the Savalaswas. Prajapati Daka was very expert in beginning children, and Narada Muni is very expert in delivering all the conditioned souls back home, back to Godhead. Therefore, the materialistic experts do not agree with the spiritual expert Narada Muni. But this does not mean that Narada Muni will give up his engagement of chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. Um Timidandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Kadadhar Sivasati Gauda Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Bhagavad Gita. There's a nice verse in the Bhagavad Gita. It sort of illustrates the main point 
in this uh, verse here. And that is, what is night for the conditioned soul is the time of awakening for the self-realized person. And what is time of awake, what is night for the self-realized person is night for the conditioned soul. Second chapter. Hmm. I think. Is that second chapter? Yeah. Which verse 67? Hmm? Which one? 59? No, it's not 59. No. 69, that's what I thought. Yeah, okay. What is night for all beings is the time of awakening for the self-control. And the time of awakening for all beings is night for the introspective sage, purport. There are two classes of intelligent men. One is intelligent in material activities for sense gratification, and the other is introspective and awake to the cultivation of spiritual realization. Activities of the introspective sage or thoughtful men are night for persons materially absorbed. Materialistic persons remain asleep in such a night due to their ignorance of self-realization. The introspective sage remains alert in the night of the materialistic men. The sages feel transcendental pleasure in the gradual advancement of spiritual culture, whereas the man in material activities, being asleep to self-realization, dreams of varieties of sense pleasure, feeling sometimes happy and sometimes distress in his sleeping condition. The introspective man is always indifferent to materialistic happiness or distress. He goes on with his self-realization activities undisturbed by material reactions. So we see that really illustrates that there are generally two classes of men. They don't mix, just like crows and swans don't mix. How many people have come here who are really materialistic and they actually want to increase their material happiness. Well, of course, some people mistakenly think that's what spiritual life is about. But generally, people who are enthusiastic for material life don't find any time or any interest in spiritual activities. Their, their foot is fully on the throttle of material pursuits. And therefore, they remain, what we say, oblivious to the important thing in life, self-realization. And they will teach and also become very enthusiastic about material life. Sometimes they take up very big positions in order to teach, to teach others how to become expert in the process of sense gratification. And they appear to be very happy, but they're not, <laughs> because their appearance is simply the hope that happiness will somehow manifest in one day or the other. If you know what, if you want to know what happiness in material world is, it means the the hope that someday you'll be happy. <laughs> so it's just an illusion. Yeah, I mean, if you don't believe me, try it. <laughs> and when it's too late, then when you finally give it up, then you can take the spiritual life. But we don't recommend that. Just take good advice. Material life simply means suffering. That's all. A hard struggle to get something you can't keep and you can't enjoy. And even if you get it, you lose it anyway. Well, think about it. It's all there is, really. So why pursue that, which is ephemeral and illusionary and has nothing to do with reality? Some people say, you spiritualists, you spiritual people, especially, you're escaping from reality. No, we're escaping into reality. This is the illusion. <laughs> and we find great happiness in our spiritual activities because we know it's happy when we perform it and ultimately it leads to the perfection of all happiness, that is eternal life in the spiritual world, full of knowledge and full of bliss. Therefore, even though the materialists are very enthusiastic to sign somehow to dissuade or disillusion or even to somehow prevent spiritual activities, we don't be, we're not bothered what such persons. <laughs> we, 
we're not bothered because we know it's like a children just talking nonsense. You know, ch children can speak very fast, right? And they can speak very, sometimes even they even make sense for a few moments, but most of the time they don't. <laughs> Those of your mothers, you know that, right? <laughs> they expect you to understand what they say. <laughs> so similarly, when the materialists you know, are chattering about the glories of material life, we just think, you know, it's just children's nonsense, that's all. <laughs> it's basically the whole thing. And Narada Muni, he's not per perturbed by that, although he's doing something directly against one of the biggest materialists at the time. Although he's a prajapati, he has a service, and he has to bring about the creation, and he's quite good at it. The name, the name Daka, Daksha, Daka, it depends. In Hindi, it's Daksha, and in Bengali, it's Daka. He, the word means expert. But what is his expertise? Begetting children. <laughs> and he's good at it. He can beget so many children at a time. And he has, he's empowered to do that by the Supreme Lord in order to bring about the, what we say, the propagation of the progeny in order to populate the universe after the previous dissolution, the creations re-manifesting again. And so, in his, in, his, in his enthusiasm, he's a little bit proud of his position and very attached to it. So therefore, Narada Muni is interfering with his service. <laughs> and therefore, he's lamenting. As it says here, Lord Brahma pacified him with instructions. You know, this is Narada Muni. This is what he's going to do. Don't worry about it. Just go on and prop just do, you know, perform your service again and make some more kids. And he does. This time, the first time, how many did he do? 25,000? Was it? Huh? 10,000. And now he, I think he just lost a little enthusiasm. So he only produced 1,000 this time. And uh, as you go on, you'll see Narada Muni is not disturbed. He knows his service. Just like we know, we preach and people may criticize, they might even not even accept what we have to say. But we don't care because we know, they say if you try to please some of the, some, if you try to please, you can please some of the people some of the time, you can please all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. That's just the way it is. So why worry about that? Just try to please Krishna. <laughs> That's all. And if you please Krishna, then that's all that counts. Because when you please Krishna, ultimately you're satisfied. And other people are also satisfied by your pleasing Krishna. So everyone benefits when Krishna is pleased. Because he's the source and the connection of everything within existence. So devotees are not dissuaded by the you know, materialistic propaganda that sometimes do, do not accept or even criticize what we are doing. Right? And sometimes, like I remember out on Sankar time, you're out there on Sankar times, those of you who distribute books, you know, people say, what are you doing? Why don't you get a job? You know, be a, you know, be a, contribute to society. Have some value in life. Why are you just begging? <laughs> we're not begging on our behalf, we're begging on, on your behalf. Because if you give something, you benefit. And if you read this book, you really benefit. So we're not here on to, to, you know, to perform the activities of beggar for our own interest. We're here on the mission to, pro to better the conditioned soul's existence in this world by giving them a chance to understand a little bit about their eternal relationship with the Lord. So people may even criticize. Just like if you try to give can medicine to a child. The medicine's good for the child, right? But because the child doesn't like the taste of the medicine, the, the doctor or the parent has to think how to make the child take the medicine. So they might mix it with something sweet, right? Make it take the medicine. But somehow the medicine has to go. So the devotees are always thinking, the materialists don't want it. <laughs> they don't want it. They don't want Krishna consciousness. They want happiness, but they don't know what happiness is. Therefore, they think Krishna consciousness is another form of just giving up 
the pursuit of happiness. You know, the idea of giving up no sex, no intoxication. When Prabhupada's god brother went to London, and this, this, he met one lord, Lord Zetlin. And Lord Zetlin had been in India. He was the governor of Bengal for a while. And he had some understanding of the Vedic culture. So he was very respective to Srila Prabhupada's god brother. And he wanted to be very polite and accommodating. So he said to Prabhupada's godmother, can you make me a brahmana? <laughs> can you make me a brahmana? And he said, the sadhu said, yes, we can make you a brahmana. You simply follow these principles. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, and no gambling. Gambling. And his response was, impossible. <laughs> This is our life. <laughs> Impossible. So when Prabhupada came to America to start Krishna consciousness, he was thinking of that incident. And he also said, I came here to give something impossible. Ability and what we say, resilience. But that wears out. And then, and when, old, when one gets in towards 50s or like that, the whole body just starts crumbling. Because it's not natural. It's not natural to use the body in that way. Therefore, there's so many physical problems people have because of what we say, wild youth, like that. So, therefore, we can see that what goes on as happiness is simply the cause of suffering. We, might, we don't even say it's not happiness. We say it's the cause of suffering. So the more one restrains themselves from material attachments and material activities and focuses themselves on Krishna consciousness activity, then you can start to open the door to Sukham Kartava, to real happiness. Therefore, Narada Muni knows that the welfare of the, of the living entity is spiritual realization. Therefore, as a compassionate person, he self-realized already. He doesn't have anything to gain by giving this knowledge to others. And yet he's being criticized for doing it. That's the nature of a self-realized person. They don't have anything to gain personally by what they do. They're doing it as a service to the Lord and as a compassionate offering to the conditioned souls. They simply do it for the benefit of others and the pleasure of the Lord. But yet... When they do it, they get criticized. They get criticized, but they don't care. They don't really care. Because they know that this criticism is like a child chattering nonsense. <laughs> it has no effect. <laughs> Just like Prabhupada said, you know, a crow may curse a cow. Well, who cares? <laughs> The cow is not affected by the crow's curse. <laughs> the cow is much more powerful than the crow. And so, just like Prabhupada said that, yeah, yeah, you know, when a lower animal or a lower person curses somebody greater, it has no effect. It has no effect. You know, it's like some little person, little kid says to you, I hate you. I hope you suffer. It doesn't matter what they say. <laughs> so it's like that. The materialists may, may throw their, you know, their words of you know, torment, but the devotee doesn't care. He goes on with his preaching. He goes on with his Krishna consciousness. Because he's clear. His mind is, is clear based on the understanding that spiritual life is life. Material life is simply an opportunity to get out of the suffering. That's all. This is what material life is about. It's a chance to make an end to suffering. So our present situation is allowing us to move away from that through the process of bhakti. That's all. That's all. Therefore, the purpose of material life is to get you to spiritual life. <laughs> That's all. That's all. And if you think there's any, there's any other purpose, 
then you'll just stay in this material world until you finally come to the conclusion that this material world is just what it is, a place of suffering. That's all. Everyone suffers. And nowadays, you can look at the statistics. Suffering is climbing higher and higher you know, on the barometer, right? Mental health is increasing. I just read a statistic the other day. I was amazed. I couldn't believe this. And it was coming from the World Health Organization out of Washington, D.C., which is one of the biggest think tanks in the world. They, their whole program is to gather statistics. 800,000 people a year, 800,000 people a year commit suicide. That's almost a million people a year. Imagine how much frustration people are undergoing. 800,000, huh? I don't, I don't know how big the city is. It's the city of Chicago is what, 6 million, something like that. No, I'm just asking what is the what is the population of Chicago? Hmm? Ten million? It's about eight million. And so one tenth of Chicago, that, that population commits that much suicide worldwide. Eight hundred thousand. That's a, a phenomenal number. That means there's so much dissatisfaction in, in material life. People are they're not they're not even materially situated anymore, where they can somehow or other live a so-called normal life and die like a normal person. That's gone now. Why? Because people think the more you pursue sense gratification. Now, sense gratification is pursued as a national policy. The governments encourage it. They also give ways to do it like that. So whole nations are going wholesale in one direction, just suffering. That's all. So many problems, crime, drugs, alcohol, so many things, broken relationships. The statistics are phenomenal. And therefore, the only need in today's society is spiritual life. Krishna consciousness. So therefore, Narada Muni, he understands this, that if you want to benefit someone, bring them to Krishna. You can feed them, you can give them some material remunerations in whatever form it may come, food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, there's so many ways. And these may have some value, but ultimately, unless persons come to Krishna consciousness, they continue to suffer. That's all. They continue to suffer. And therefore, uh, self-realized soul is compassionate. Therefore, Prabhupada says, uh, a materialistic person and a spiritual person never agree. <laughs> they never agree, because they have two directions in life. One's on the path of, you know, increased material enjoyment, and the other one's on the path of renunciation from that same thing. It's like two opposite, you know, persons. The Prabhupada used the example, it's like the crow and the swan. The crow is a very nasty bird, makes a lot of noise, hangs around garbage cans, right? In India, of course we don't see it in the West, but in India the crows are always in the garbage dumps, jumping up and down all over the garbage. It's like a Mahotsava, it's a festival. And the swans, they're in the clear, beautiful lakes, and they're amongst the, you know, the lotus flowers. They're beautiful, and they're very graceful. If you take milk and water and you mix it together and you give it to a swan, He'll drink the milk from the water and leave the water without touching the, the water. Yeah, that's the swan. He has that ability. So God teaches us through and through nature, you know, the nature of a spiritual person. He can take the best out of the worst situation and not touch the worst. So we want to become like swan, 
Therefore, one practices Krishna consciousness, we understand there's nothing else to, to aspire for. Why? Because the living entity can only find satisfaction through spiritual activities, not through material activities. Material activities may somehow or other stabilize one's existence, but they do not give happiness nor freedom from suffering either. That's the nature. So Narada Muni, he's not moved by Prajapati Daksha's endeavors. And it's interesting, Prajapati Daksha is not a small materialist. He's up there in the category. He's even being encouraged by Brahma to do his service. But Narada comes along and just messes it up. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way we want to mess up people's lives, right? Just tell them, you know, you're useless. Why don't you take the Krishna consciousness? Of course, we have to do it in such a way that they want to accept what we say. Therefore, it's like candy coating the mess in medicine. Because nobody really wants to give up sense gratification. Nobody does. Everyone wants to enjoy the senses, and sometimes they want to come to spiritual life and do the same thing. But there is sensual enjoyment in spiritual life, but it's not material. It's the soul also has a form, and the soul has senses. So when you practice spiritual life, you awaken your spiritual senses. And the spiritual senses can taste happiness much more greater than the material senses. Because the material senses are simply a covering over the spiritual senses. And therefore, they're more like a shadow of the reality. <clears throat> so material senses are you know, just, you know, they dissolve in time and spiritual senses become awakened. Therefore, simply by seeing the beautiful form of Shishi Kishore Kishori, one becomes happy. One's mind becomes satisfied. One hearts be one's heart becomes you know, attracted to them. By tasting the prasadam, one's, one's desire for satisfying the tongue becomes fulfilled. By dancing and chanting, you know, then everything is there. Kirtan is, complete, is, the, is the complete program of satisfaction. Okay. So these are the activities that make spiritual life very tasty and sweet. And material activities, you get something, you might enjoy it for a few minutes and then it's gone. The enjoyment's gone. Right? That's why you see, in material life, people are always looking for something new, something different. Because whatever you have materially, you get tired of it. It gets old, right? You need something different, something new. Or if they don't change, they just stay in their same situation and become bored. Right? Hmm. Material life actually is more boring than suffering. But boredom is another form of suffering. Right? I remember when I was a kid and we would you know, go out on Friday night and we'd be driving around. Hey, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> Nobody knew what to do. And then you, just, then you find something to do and you get tired of that. What else should we do? I don't know. It's boring. It's like, so then, you know, this is material life. It's just boring. Why? Because it's like a... It's like a rerun black and white movie. Right? You turn on the television, you see a movie. It's black and white. You've seen it 40 times, and you turn it on for the 41st time. You know? It's the same thing. It's material life. So, therefore, although everyone's enthusiastic about it, that's the thing. Why is that? Why do people have some enthusiasm for material life? Because they have hope that in the future it will be get better. It's a dream. They live in the dream. That's so. Why? Because everyone is doing it. 
There's a thing called the hundred monkeys. You ever heard of the story of the hundred monkeys? No? Under monkeys is one monkey teaches one monkey how to eat bananas <laughs> or maybe fruit. And the other monkey teaches that monk that monkey teaches the second, the third monkey, and then down the line. When it gets to the hunter's monkey, he just does it because everyone else is doing it. He doesn't think anymore, should I do it or not do it? It's nothing new. Everybody's doing it. So it must be the right thing to do. Yeah, illicit sex, yeah, everybody's doing it, must be good. You know. <laughs> and what else? Whoa. Um, go here, try this, do that. Yeah, everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it, right? I was on the plane the other day. I was traveling from, Cro from London to Croatia. And there was a group of these guys, <clears throat> I don't know, I guess it was a stag party. And one guy, all he had on was a pair of black underwear, that's all. And over the top of it, he had this pink tights. And you could see right through it. I don't know even why they let him on the plane. And I was thinking, this guy is nuts. And all his friends were there, right? I guess he was getting married or something. It was a stag party or something like that. So they travel from one country to another. Europe, it's like that. As many of the countries are, you know, very good for vacations. So, and he looked really funny. He had this tight pink suit that covered from his head down to his feet. It was so tight. And underneath he had a pair of black underwear. That's all. That's all he had on. I, I was trying not to laugh. <laughs> Again, the rest of the passengers thought it was normal, I guess. <laughs> and uh, while we were, after we got off the plane, we got onto the bus to take us to the terminal. And he came up to me, he said, could I take a picture with you? <laughs> so I didn't, his friend was already snapping the photo before I could answer, so. <laughs> And I didn't say anything, I just stood there. I said one thing, I said, I like your haircut, because he had this little seeker coming through the top of his pink tights. <laughs> <laughs> so people are nuts, you know, they don't, they're so bored, and they try all these different crazy things, right? Bungee jumping, right? You jump off a crane on a, a giant elastic band. And you have no, we know what bungee jumping is, right? It's another thing. I don't know how popular that is anymore. It used to be popular. Did you try it? Oh, okay. Did anybody here try it? If you did, you'll never try it more than once. <laughs> so it's just, you know, this is material life. It's so, people are so bored, right? And they're so bored. You know, you go to, you go to New York, it says, Go to Puerto Rico, enjoy the nice scenic islands with the nice beautiful beaches and so many nice things. And you go to Puerto Rico, you see a sign, go to New York. <laughs> yeah, it's like to enjoy the nice, you know, city with all the highlights and movies. And yeah, It's just like nobody knows what to do. <laughs> it's just material life like that. So, you know, therefore, when we preach Krishna consciousness, you know, we're actually giving people a chance to get out of this. And people, they'll, you know, some people will not accept. We don't care. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, a preacher will preach to the four walls, even if there's nobody there to talk to. He says, that's our business to preach. Some will take, some won't take. But still, we go on with our service. Narada Muni, he's going on with his service. He's getting resistance, but still, he's not deterred. He knows that this is the best thing. So, <clears throat> so the materialists and the spiritualists, they never agree. They never agree. Any questions? <laughs> Hare 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the discussion. Um, this topic, how the materialists and the spiritualists are, like, one is operating in the nighttime and one's operating in the daytime. I was wondering, we hear in the Goswami Ashtakam that the Goswamis were dear, dear Jana Priya. Mm -hmm. so they were dear to both the, the saints and the ruffians. Mm -hmm. um, this seems to be like complementing this point that comes up in this verse that these two persons are fundamentally opposed. But then we, we see in, in the character of saintly persons, they're still able to relate with and have very pleasant, wonderful exchanges, positive exchanges. Sometimes. I mean, Narada Muni was there with Kamsa. And Kamsa honored Narada Muni and respected Narada Muni like that. So that's there. But, you know, that's a rare thing, generally. What it is, is that some the materialists also somehow or other they won't do what the spiritualists do, but they may appreciate that character. So what is dear to them is the character. What is that verse in the Bhagavad Gita, fifth chapter? Fifth chapter, verse number... I got the Gita here, okay. Seven, right there. I think, yeah, yeah, five, seven, I think that's, I think you got it. I love this verse. Yoga Yukta Visudatma Vijitatma Jitendriya Sarva Bhutatma Bhutatma Kurvana Pina Limpitang. One who works in the devotion, who is a pure soul, who controls his mind and senses, is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. Though always working, such a man is never entangled. Mm hmm. Why? Because the spiritualists don't want anything from the materialists. In that way, the materialists never feel threatened by them. In that sense. We're not after their money or their anything they have. So, so but in, they, they exhibit the qualities of, you know, respect, tolerance, humility like that. So in that sense, they become dear. And they become what we say, yeah, dear to, to all. And they also become dear because what they're giving is, you know, the best thing for everyone, both the ruffians and the, what we say, the, the pious. But not everyone will recognize that. Some will. In the case of the Goswamis, they were ideal in everything, their character, their devotion, and the renunciation. No. Any other questions? Who knows some of the contributions that Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur has given us in the form of this Krishna conscious practice? Which ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jairad good. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of our practice, the ones we, we regularly use. What, what's another one we, we use every day? No? The, the, uh, the first one or the second one? That's Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Yeah. But there's another song we sing every day that... It's done by Bhakti Vinod. There's two more, actually. There's two more. Gorarti, yeah. Kibajayo. And what's the other one? Yeah, Sarira Vijaja. Mm -hmm. That's Bhakti Vinod Thakur, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So his contribution is very much what we say, imbibed within our Krishna consciousness movement. Prabhupada liked Bhakti Vinod Thakur's teachings because he felt that Bhakti Vinod Thakur was very relevant to the Western minds. And a lot of the things he wrote and did were to inspire Westerners 
and spiritual life. <clears throat> Therefore, he tried in his works to bridge the gap between the two cultures. And therefore, Prabhupada said that you should read the works of Bhakti Vinodak, or especially he gave two books that we should read: Chaitanya Shikshamrita and Jaiva Dharma, and especially Jaiva Dharma, because Jaiva Dharma is the science of Bhakti, told in a what we say a story form. It takes the setting of a guru and disciples exchanging discussion and the knowledge is imparted stage by stage all the way up to the highest form of spiritual knowledge and it teaches the whole science of bhakti it is more definitive and more intricate than nectar of devotion so jiva dharma is good we've translated that i think we probably have copies around somewhere that's a book you can read, and you can reread, and you can study. It's, and it's interestingly written. It's not just dry presentation of knowledge. It's a dialogue. <laughs> like that. And then, of course, Chaitanya Shikshamrita is also very important. It has many aspects of bhakti yoga in it. But Prabhupada said, he told the translators to eventually translate all of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's works into English and have it available for devotees like that. So today is his disappearance day. Um, he's the person that discovered Lord Chaitanya's birthplace when it was lost because of time. And persons could not understand where that site was. And he, what we say, resurrected that site and established it by carefully studying old maps. It was mistakenly designated in another place, and then he showed that that was wrong, and he showed the real place like that. He is also called the father of this Krishna consciousness movement because. At one time he had a vision. He was looking in the area where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had performed, where, where he had, had appeared, and uh, Bhakti Thakur had a vision. And in the vision he saw something very prophetic. He saw in the future there will be people from every race, all the races, and they were all singing and dancing together, chanting Jai Sachinandana. Jai Satchinandana. So he was a visionary, and he also spoke about that. And then, of course, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati appeared in this world in order to bring it about. He established the foundation, and Prabhupada actually, our Prabhupada actually, did the actual work of it. But it was Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj who, who began the work by sending his disciples to different places around the world to spread Krishna consciousness, which hadn't been done before. Many sadhus came from India, holy men, but they came more or less on their own program to somehow or other make followers and to attract Westerners and somehow or other set up something. <clears throat> it wasn't really selfless. There was some motivation there. Uh, but... Bhakti Siddhanta simply wanted to uh, fulfill the prophecy spoken by Lord Chaitanya that in every town and village the teachings of Lord Chaitanya would be. Therefore, Bhakti Vinodha Kaur was very instrumental in making that happen. There was one book that was written in 18... Not, no, it was written before then. It was called The Teachings and Precepts of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's a small book. It's only about 100 pages. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur had it published, in, I think in the English language, and he sent that book to many universities around the world. It was found by our devotees in McGill University in Canada when they were doing the library party. It was discovered. But later we discovered that that same book went to many other universities. And, and it was very prophetic because when that book was sent, it was the year 1896 which was the same year that Prabhupada appeared. 
So the book that was the basis of the teachings and the persons who would take the teachings appeared in the same year around the world. So you can see that this movement is not some kind of, you know, some some holy men got together and decided to start something. It's it's actually instituted by the Lord himself. It's rare in that sense. So therefore, this movement is actually authorized by God. <laughs> Where others are doing things, but they may not have the authorization or the adhikari. Adhikari means the qualifications to do what they're doing. But Mahaprabhu is directly making this movement happen. And it doesn't matter you know, who comes and who doesn't come. It'll happen. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya's movement will spread around. The, the, the question is, who's going to get the credit? So as Lord, as Lord Krishna told Arjuna, it doesn't matter if you fight. All these persons on the battlefield are already killed by my will. You can be my instrument. And you can also benefit by taking up this work. But if you don't do it, it'll happen anyway. So in that sense, Lord Chaitanya's movement will spread around the world. But it's just, the thing is that the Lord is eager to have it done as fast as possible. So if we don't want to waste Krishna's time, <laughs> so take up this mission of spreading Krishna consciousness in the world. The, tr the roots of the tree are our hearing and chanting. The trunk of the tree is our relationship with the other devotees and our service. And the crown of the tree is the fruits of the tree, and that is our preaching. So the tree is actually shows its fruits when it gives something as an offering to the benefit of others. So the, tr the tree's offering is its fruits for the benefit of others. So the fruits of our bhakti is to somehow or other attract others to Krishna consciousness. So you may say, well, I'm not so qualified. But become qualified. Study the books. And practice this very seriously. There may be difficulties. There may even be reverses. But these things will go, come and go. As long as one remains in the association of devotees and practices with enthusiasm, then Krishna will empower that person to make progress. So reverses are actually opportunities to go deeper and become more serious in spiritual life. Reverses are not obstacles that block our path. They're simply opportunities to use more of our surrender and become purified like that. So never see obstacles or reverses or difficulties as discouragements. If you get discouraged, then you don't understand how Krishna is working to help you and to purify you by giving you some difficulties in order to bring you to a higher stage. So Bhakti Vinod Kaur, he prays like that. Bhakti Vinod Thakur prays. He, 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 he speaks very rhetorically. He says, my dear Lord, what is my happiness in my service to you? And then he names him under many things. But then he ends, he says, my happiness, my real happiness is the difficulties that I encounter in your service. <laughs> so nobody wants difficulties, right? We want the smooth road. But the road becomes smooth as we accept the difficulties. If we run away from the difficulties, guess what happens? The difficulties become greater. They become greater. Each time you retreat from difficulties and take another the path of sense, you'll find it becomes harder and harder to practice spiritual life. <clears throat> if you stay on the path of it doesn't matter. The difficulties are opportunities. How many book distributors we got here? One, two. I thought there's a few we left already. Would you like to hear a book distribution story? Here's an opera. Here's here's how difficulties actually become opportunities. One devotee was distributing books in Holland, the Netherlands, and he went into an. And the devotees there carry. He carries carrying many different 
He was carrying many books with him. Mostly Bhagavad Gita. So he was distributing in an area he wasn't, wasn't legal. It was kind of a security area. Kind of a private area. And he couldn't go. So there was a security guard who saw him. And the security guard got a little bit upset. So started coming towards him. The devotee did apparently did the wrong thing. He started to run. <laughs> and the security guard started to chase him. So there was a chase, and the devotee ran down this alley, and he came, comes to a dead end. No way out. And then he looks, and he sees a door at the end of the alley, and he decides, let me try and see if it's open. He opens it, and the door opens. He runs inside. He's in a dark hall. He doesn't know where he is. He walks down. And he notices at the end of the dark hall that there's a light. And he comes. He finally comes out to the light. And then he walks all the way in. And there's actually a stage show going on. <laughs> and there's an announcer. And there's a group of people sitting in the in the audience. And when he and he just and he just keeps coming. Finally, he gets into the area of the stage. And the announcer looks and notices him. He says. Oh, you finally come. We were waiting for you. Did you bring the gifts? And the devotee started to think, okay, now I'm going to start to play the role here. So he did that. He said, yes, I actually brought the gifts. And he showed him the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and the man said, well, how much do we owe you for that? So he named some price. And the man, and on the spot, wrote out a check. He gave him all the Gitas, gave him a big check. And then the man said, the devotee had to ask, well, what is this program? He was a little curious. He said, this is the butcher's convention. <laughs> and we're giving out prizes sent to the top butchers here. <laughs> so he distributed all his books, got a large donation. And so... See, that's Krishna consciousness. <laughs> it may seem difficult, but if you stick with it, Krishna it's Krishna is a magician. He knows how to take something and turn it into something on the opposite. As long as we have that spirit of enthusiasm and always willing to surrender like that. So that's a nice story. Okay, today is also the appearance, the disappearance day of Gadadhar Pandit. And I'll speak briefly about Gadadhar Pandit. I think I said a few words. But he, Lord Chaitanya went to, to, to um, Puri when he took sannyas and, and under the instructions of the devotees, in order for them to be with him, he decided to take up residence in Puri instead of Vrindavan. So Gadadhar Pandit, feeling the separation with the Lord, also left Navadvipa and came to stay with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he took a vow. Lord Chaitanya gave him a deity to worship. It was called Gopinath. It was actually Tota Gopinath. Have anybody been to the Tota Gopinath temple? No? Yeah? Yeah. Tota means garden. And then there's a big, big garden area outside of the temple. It's a, it's a nice compound. The deity at that time was very huge. Now the deity is sitting down. He's a sitting down Krishna deity playing the flute. <laughs> this is the deity when Mahaprabhu disappeared from the world. He entered into that deity and, and disappeared from the world. There's a mark on the deity's leg, which the Pujari show. This is Mahap, where Mahaprabhu entered into the deity like that. So this deity was worshipped by Gadadhar Pandit. And Lord Chaitanya did that just to show how dear Gadadhar Pandit is to him. So that was his personal deity he worshipped. How did the deity get sitting down? Well, Lord Chaitanya left the planet. Gadadhar Pandit was still serving the deity by dressing him and taking, doing all the puja every day. So, Gadadhar Pandit was suffering tremendously after the disappearance of Lord Chaitanya. And it says that his body was aging one year every day. Lord Chaitanya disappeared from this world at the age of 48, and Gadadhar Pandit was the same age. 
So although he was only 48 years old, he was still suffering like an old man because he was feeling such separation from the Lord. So one day when he was trying to dress the deity, he was trying to put the crown on Gopinath's head. And Gopinath's a big deity, tall. And he was lifting it up and he couldn't put it on. Something he had done every day, but today, that day was difficult. So Gopinath, feeling compassion for his, de for his devotee, sat down. The deity actually sat down. So today he's in a sitting position. <laughs> he's in a sitting position. And then, uh, of course, it was 11 months later that Gadadhar Pandit left the planet after Lord Chaitanya's disappearance. And he only stayed for one reason. Because Srinivas Acharya wanted to learn Srimad Bhagavatam from Gadadhar Pandit. So he, ta he stayed to teach Srinivas Acharya. But he never got to teach him. Because, Srinib because when Srinivas Acharya came to learn from Gadadhar Pandit, the uh, teachings of Bhagavatam, Gadadhar Pandit, in separation from Lord Chaitanya, when he would read his Bhagavatam every day, he would cry. And the tears would smudge the ink on the paper. And therefore the Bhagavatam became somewhat unreadable. So when Srinivasacharya wanted lessons, Gadadhar said, you take my Bhagavatam and go back to the scribes in Navadvip, because they could do it. They could rescribe the book and have it redone and bring it back to me. But when he left, Gadadhar Pandit couldn't withstand the separation from Lord Chaitanya. And then he left the world without teaching Srinivas. When Srinivas got back, he was very unhappy. That's a wonderful pastime. But that deity is very, very special like that. So uh, Gadadhar Pandit being Radharani herself in that form like that. So today is the disappearance of Gadadhar Pandit. And uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say about Gadadhar Pandit. Hmm. Can't remember. Yes. In a different mood, what was... Yeah, Radharani's mood, she's a left-wing gopi. That means her mood towards Krishna is somewhat contrary. She doesn't always agree with Krishna. She fights with him sometimes or argues and then there's some intricate. If you want love to be exciting, have a, have a person who don't know, doesn't, doesn't always agree with you all the time. And that makes the loving relating. Yeah, yeah. Get a wife or a husband that you can fight with, but there's still love there then it's a lot of fun. Otherwise, it's boring. <laughs> That's the best of the material you can get. <laughs> it's not that you fight and break up. It's the, the love is there, but the mood of expressing that love becomes somewhat contrary to the desires of one or the other. And that makes the love exciting. That's called lawless love. That love which is not, no, not predictable. So God, that's Radharani's mood. There's many stories to illustrate that. But and when he came, when she came as Gadadhar Pandit, her mood was very. She was like a right wing gopi, which is the right wing gopis always agree with Krishna. They never are never contrary to his you know, his nature or his his desires. So she was there like that, in that mood. But there was one one pastime. Should I tell that pastime? It's a beautiful pastime. It's one of my favorite. Where when Lord Chaitanya came to Jagannath Puri, Gadadhar Pandit came. And Gadadhar Pandit was given the deity of Gopinath to worship. And then Gadadhar Pandit took a vow. That vow is called Shetra Sanyas. That means you don't leave the deity for the rest of your life. You worship that deity. You stay, Shetra means place. So he took sannyas in a particular place. That means no moving out of that place. But one day, Lord Chaitanya wanted to go traveling to Vrindavan, and then Gadadhar Pandit wanted to go with him. But Lord Chaitanya said, you can't go. You've taken the vow of Shetra sannyas. If you break that vow, what, what will I be criticized? 
<coughs> Magadhar Pandit was determined to go with Lord Chaitanya out of love. So this was love that was contrary. Yeah. You want he wanted to be with him out of love, but Lord Chaitanya said, No, <coughs> I've come to teach religious principles and you're gonna break them. <laughs> So, <laughs> therefore, it's not going to work. So you have to stay here. And then he still didn't agree, but finally Lord Chaitanya went anyway. Finally Lord Chaitanya went anyway. But then he came back after a short period of time without fulfilling his desire to reach Vrindavan. That's a long story. And when he came back, all the devotees were amazed that he had appeared so soon again. And they asked him, how is it you're so back so early? Of course, we, it's wonderful you've come back. He said, I committed offense to Gadadhar. <laughs> and therefore, Krishna would not let me go to Vrindavan. He said, I hurt the heart of Gadadhar. And this is an interesting point, that one should not cause any discomfort to any devotee. Even accidentally, if you cause discomfort to another devotee, that could be considered an offense. Therefore, one should be very sensitive and careful in the association of all these other devotees <clears throat> to act in such a way that you don't cause what we say uh, uh, distress or inconvenience. You might disagree. Disagreeing is there. Disagreeing is always there. But there's always friendship and service as the foundation of the relationship. Two people can still disagree and still have a wonderful relationship. But nowadays, people think, if you don't agree with me, you know, my way or the highway, right? <laughs> you take a walk, Jack. That's what they say, right? <laughs> but that's not, that's not life. You can dis disagree and still have a wonderful relationship, especially in spiritual life. So disagreement, when it becomes enmity or envy or conflict, then it's offensive. We respectfully disagree sometimes. But one should not cause distress to anyone. Either There's three ways you cause distress. Through the body, through the mind, and through words. The, the mind is the more subtle, the more gross is the words, and the body is the worse. That's the corporal offense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Corporal offense. So therefore, one should be very sensitive. So Lord Chaitanya wanted to teach this process that one should not somehow or other cause harm, disturbance to any. Although he didn't. There's many examples of how in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, he used an ordinary situation to teach, you know, how to act. But in the same time, there was nothing wrong with the situation, but still it appears that he used that to show that this is the way you shouldn't act. And there's many examples of that. Did you follow that? You know, in other words, you do something, there's nothing wrong, but still someone, he takes exception and shows that even though there's nothing wrong because someone else was offended by you doing what is normal, it's wrong. So these are the subtle aspects of Vaishnav culture. So therefore devotees always are friendly and try to work together to serve each other in Krishna consciousness. Like that. Okay, so Gadadhar Pandit, today is his disappearance day and Bhakti Vinotak, a very, very, very holy day. It's also Amavasya, the dark moon today also. So, very auspicious day. I don't think there's fasting today, right? There, hmm? mm -hmm. There's fasting today? The, the calendar says... We are fasting today. Oh, wonderful. Lily Bo, everybody's enthusiasm just dropped, right? 
Oh no, this is every, everything I like about Krishna consciousness is wonderful except this, you know. <laughs> but Prabhupada said, fasting is feasting and feasting is fasting. You got it? It makes sense because by fasting you're purifying and by feasting you're purifying. So you get purified both, both ways. There is actual fast today, huh? It's on the calendar? I didn't see it on the calendar. I'm just wondering. Okay. You're doing it. I thought it was a fast day because these are two very powerful acharyas. And usually on the powerful acharyas we do have some fasting. Anyway, you get to eat again. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come in time. <laughs> Absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> you appreciate something when it's gone for a while. <laughs> right? Okay. So, Gadadhar Pandit Ki, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur Ki, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. All right, Krishna. So the program today is going to start at 11 o'clock with Pajans until 11:30. And then 11:30 to 12:15, there's a some kind of lecture. And then 12:15, there'll be Push Panjali, RT, and then for seven, a little after one. Thanks. All right, Krishna.